and a warm welcome to you who are here with us and also to those who are watching this service online today. A special welcome to Caitlin and Denise and Dorling's daughters. Caitlin's come from North Wales. It's lovely to have you with us today. Now we don't have a new weekly notice sheet this week because of the holiday season and last week's notices remain current for the month of August. One thing to add, however, in light of the most recent Welsh Government briefing regarding the lifting of the COVID restrictions, is that the Church's leadership team will be meeting the week after next, well, the week after this one, to discuss the opening up of the Church in the near future and how to do this as safely as possible. And we would ask for your prayers, please, as we make these very important decisions. So next week will be the same as this week in terms of booking a place. It would be remiss of me not to wish a very happy birthday to Anne Crampton today. Where's Anne? A very happy birthday, Anne. We hope you have a very enjoyable day. And last but not least, I'd like to extend a special welcome and thank you to our friend and fellow member, the Reverend Pam Simmons, who is leading our worship today. Thank you for being with us, Pam, and leading our service, and we look forward to hearing your message. Let us now turn to God in our opening prayer. Pass through the gates of God's temple with thanks. Come into his courts with praise. Praise him and thank him, for the Lord is good, his devotion lasts forever, and his faithfulness to one generation after another. Father God, open our hearts and minds this day to what you have to say to us during this worship service, and we pray especially for Reverend Pam that you will reveal to us your truth through her. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Elizabeth. Morning everybody. Not so hot this morning, is it? It's a bit better though, isn't it? Lovely to see you all. Come into the presence of God as those who are seeking to serve with faithfulness, as those who are pure in heart and mind, as those who are true to God's purposes. Come into the presence of God as you are and as you would be and know that you are loved for yourselves and for your great desire today and forever. Psalm 42 begins with the words, As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. And we're going to have a hymn now, which is based on that verse from that psalm. So we'll sing this prayerfully. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. Thank you. 
Let's pray. Eternal and everlasting God, you came to our world in Christ, sharing our humanity. You come to us each day through your Holy Spirit, sharing in our every experience. So now we come to you to share together in fellowship with you and one another. We come to acknowledge your omnipotence, to recognize your goodness, to declare your wonderful works. We come in awe and wonder to bring our worship, ourselves, and our world before you. We come to seek your forgiveness, to confess our many faults, and to receive your measureless mercy. We come seeking your strength, your guidance, and your will. We come to read your word, to listen for your voice, and to discern your purpose. We come offering our discipleship, our gifts, talents, and abilities, committing all once again to your service. Come afresh to us now in this time of worship. Renew our commitment and vision. Renew our faith. Renew our love. Please open our eyes to your presence and our lives to your grace and power. We pray through Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. And we sing, Be still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Now we have our readings from Scripture. Thank you.
Uh, the first reading is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. The sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will then also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Amen. The second reading The second reading is taken from Philippians 3 verses 10 to 21 and then Philippians 4 verses 1 I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings becoming like him in his death and so, somehow, to attain to the resurrection from the dead, pressing on towards the goal. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind 
and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have told you before and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Amen. Thank you very much for those readings. So beautifully read. Thank you so much. I'm going back to school days again, I'm afraid. And I'm going to take Sandra down memory lane. Both of us went to Hartridge. It doesn't even exist now. I don't know whether to take that personally or not. But it was a brand new school when I started to go to Hartridge. <coughs> and as we moved up the school and got older, by the time we got to the sixth form, I think we were deemed probably sensible enough for some of us to be made prefects. And the headmaster gave us a chair cupboard as our room. It had a window and it was in the foyer of the school. He gave us three chairs, three armless, easy chairs. <coughs> there were posters on the wall. We had a Burko boiler. And we had tea and coffee for, at break time and lunch time. Paid for, the deputy head girl always made sure that was paid for. She had her book and ticked off what everybody was drinking and so on. <coughs> and every July, just before we broke up from school, we were taken in the coach with a few members of staff down to Barry Island after school. Wonderful. Can you imagine? Everybody had gone home. The beach was empty, more or less. And we had a lovely few hours in the evening. Lovely memories. As prefects, we did have a lot of privileges. But with those privileges came responsibilities. Every day, either break time or lunch time, or sometimes both, we had to be on duty. It often meant a trek of quite a distance. There were three buildings, if you know, if you know how Cartridge was laid out from the top building down to the bottom where the little ones were, was quite a trek, especially in the winter, because it was very exposed and there was wind and rain, sometimes even snow. 
And we had to do that to make sure that the other children, the younger children, were not doing too much damage or making too much noise while the members of staff were not with them. There was a lot to enjoy about being a prefect at Hartridge, but we earned it because there were a lot of responsibilities that went with it. With privileges come responsibilities. And citizenship is like that. There are privileges attached to being a citizen of a town or a city. A lot of facilities are available to people. But we also have a duty to abide by what is expected of us. And Paul mentions citizenship in that reading from Philippians. He says, our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. We, you, me, we are citizens of heaven. Shall we just reflect this morning? And let's just think about some of those privileges that come with being a citizen of heaven and also some of the responsibilities. I'm sure you can think of more than what I'm going to mention, but perhaps it'll get us all thinking. Well, privileges, there are so many, aren't there? We have the love of God in our lives. How often have we heard it said and said it ourselves? I wonder how people manage to get through difficult times, bereavement, anxieties, things going wrong in life, without being able to turn to God, without, without a faith. And so, but we have that security of somebody to turn to and support us. We rely on him so much. In those difficult times, we, we turn to him and sometimes desperately needing his help and his guidance. And every day when we turn to him and live prayerfully, we know he's with us, caring for us and guiding us. When Jesus was a human being, that's page three. I'm on page two. Beg your pardon. Now you know what I'm going to say when I move my page. We have the, the assurance then of eternity. We know this world is not all there is. And we have a future beyond what we have here. We know that. There are a lot of other people who are citizens of heaven. And so we have the fellowship of those people, people of like mind. We find a great deal of blessing in one another's company. And we benefit from one another's support and thoughtfulness. There's always somebody there to help in times of need. And a great privilege of ours is that we're following somebody who's been here before us. Somebody who's experienced all that we experience in life, in terms of pain and joy and all the other emotions. He experienced them all. Someone who's demonstrated to us how to live, how to live a life worthy of heavenly citizenship. We're following Jesus. Jesus, who left his own privileges. Paul says in that chapter in Philippians, chapter 2, he left the glory that was his and came to earth to be one of us, taking the form of a servant, humbling himself, being obedient, obedient to death, even death on a cross. He gave up his privileges for love of us. And that in itself is a privilege for us, isn't it? There are so many privileges, and as I said, I'm sure you can think of more. But 
we are the body of Christ. And that really tells us all we need to know about our responsibilities. Our responsibilities that go with privileges. Jesus sent his disciples out in twos to spread the ministry further, to do what he had been doing in further away places. And it was their first lesson in being the presence on earth of Jesus when he was no longer there in his physical form. The body of Christ. That's what that means, doesn't it? And we are to represent him just as he wanted those disciples to represent him, to do what he'd been doing. We are to represent him as the body of Christ. We are here now on his behalf to extend his kingdom, just as the disciples were sent to do. And how do we represent him then? That lovely ch uh, verse is from Matthew chapter 25 that Pat read so well. A lovely, lovely parable, one of my favorite passages. And in that parable, which we all know so well, Jesus is simply teaching us that to be a citizen of heaven, to be welcomed into the kingdom, he wants us to do things like give food and drink to the hungry and thirsty, to welcome the stranger, to clothe the naked, to visit the sick and in prison. Because he said, as you did it, for one of the least of these my brothers, you did it for me. And so we're representing him by being caring to other people. And when Jesus was here, you've heard that before this morning, when Jesus was here as a human being, he cared so much for people in such a practical way. The underprivileges, the underprivileged, the outcasts, anyone in need of any care of any kind, he was there for them. And we're to represent him doing those things now. It's our responsibility to be as Jesus to people. How can we do that? Well, by caring for people, but by trying to be like him. I used to sing a, a song when I was in my teens. I don't know if anyone remembers it. Oh, to be like him, tender and kind, lowly in spirit, lowly in mind. What was Jesus like? Let's think about that. Very gentle, wasn't he? A very gentle, tender kind of person. You remember that story of when Jairus the ruler of the synagogue came to Jesus one day and he said, please, please come to my house and heal my little daughter. And Jesus just followed him there. And as he got into the room where the, the little girl was lying on the bed, he didn't make a big show and a song and dance about healing her, not at all. I can imagine him sitting on the edge of the bed and he said, little girl, little girl, get up. And she did. She did. He was so gentle. But he was strong. When things were wrong, he would say so. When things were wrong, he could become very strong and open with his feelings. We know so well that story that we think of in Holy Week, of how he and the disciples arrived at the temple, and there they were selling sacrifices and changing money currency so that people could stay in Jerusalem for a while from all over, and so that they could offer sacrifices for their Passover. 
but most of them were cheating. Most of them were charging far too much for the sacrifices and not giving the right amount when they changed currency. And Jesus said, get out of my father's house. This is my father's house and you have made it a den of robbers. No uncertain terms, he expressed displeasure at that point and many other times too. And Jesus was compassionate. Compassion was a wonderful thing and is a wonderful thing about him. We thought a couple of weeks ago about when the leper came to Jesus and such a dreaded disease at that time and called to him and asked if he could please heal him. And Jesus didn't keep his distance. He was so compassionate towards that man that he went towards him and he touched him. So compassionate. And the woman, again we thought of her a couple of weeks ago, the woman caught in the act of adultery. She thought she was going to be stoned, stoned to death. That's what these people wanted. But he defended her. Let he who has not sinned cast the first stone. He knew that she was a woman who needed understanding and gentleness and a way of getting out of the life that she probably didn't enjoy one bit. Jesus always had time for people. Mothers brought babies and young children to Jesus, wanting him to bless them. And the disciples, well, they weren't intending to be unkind, I'm sure. I'm sure they liked children as much as any of us do. But they knew that they needed to defend and protect Jesus. Obviously, Jesus had had a, a tiring day and needed some peace. And so that's why they tried to send them away. But Jesus said, no, let the children come to me. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he took them in his arms and blessed each one. Always time for people. There was that day, wasn't there, when he'd been teaching and healing all day, and he said to the disciples, row me in the boat across to the other side of the lake where it's quieter, and we can rest, and I can go and pray. And so they did. But the people knew where he was going, and they followed him around the lake on foot. And when they turned up, what might you have said? I'm not sure that I'd have said anything particularly welcoming. But no, Jesus forgot about the fact that he needed to pray and rest. And he ministered to them again. He talked to them. He healed them. And it was on that occasion, of course, that he fed 5,000. Was it men? Was it people? Who knows? But 5,000. He fed those people with five loaves and two fish. And importantly, for all of us, he spent a lot of time in prayer. We often read of him leaving the disciples for a while, maybe a day or two, and going to somewhere quiet and private and spending time with his heavenly Father. And he spoke about the kingdom of God to people. He spoke to them and explained what it was and what it meant to be part of that kingdom at appropriate times and in appropriate situations. He told people about the kingdom of God. And all of those things, we must be looking to ourselves to do them and to be like Jesus, to, to ask God to give us some of those wonderful qualities that we've just been thinking about. We're the body of Christ, and that's another way to represent Jesus in the world. And then a third responsibility, we need to put the kingdom of God first. The kingdom of God first. It's something that we learn 
right through the scriptures. When we read of God's covenant back in the Old Testament with Abraham, when he said, you will be my people and I will be your God. He was going to look after them. He was going to lead them. He was going to be their God. But they in turn needed to put him and the kingdom first. And all through the scriptures, all through the New Testament as well, we learn that the kingdom of God always comes first. Again, I'm hearkening back to a couple of weeks ago. It's like a sequel, isn't it? But when Peter said, you were the Christ, the son of the living God, when they were at Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus warned straight away, didn't he? He was going to suffer and die at the hands of men. And if they wanted to follow him, then they were going to have to be prepared to do the same. They needed to take up their cross and follow. When it comes to choice, nothing should come before the kingdom of God. That's not always easy, but that's how it should be. The kingdom of God that Jesus spoke about so often and about which we learn so much when we read the scriptures. And so our citizenship is in heaven. When we're citizens of a town or city, as I said, we have plenty of things offered to us for us to enjoy. But we also have a duty to abide by what is required of us. Privileges and responsibilities. The same applies to us as citizens of heaven. Let me just give us all a thought to take with us today. How can you, how can I, fulfill our responsibilities as citizens of heaven? We're going to have a hymn. You may like to stand for this one. Hear the call of the kingdom to be children of light. Trust in him, King of 
And now our prayers of intercession, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray, <coughs> we pray for the church, asking that the family of Christ might show commitment to you and to your way, might show the commitment that leads to love and joy and peace and patience, kindness and goodness, gentleness, self-control and we pray for the world asking that those with power wealth or influence might show commitment to the welfare of their peoples and communities might show commitment to your principles of of justice and freedom mercy and compassion peace and understanding we pray for humankind, asking that each of us, young or old, rich or poor, might show commitment to caring for one another, might show commitment to your desire that we should care for those who are ill, comfort those who are sad, feed those who are hungry, befriend those who are alone. Loving God, teach us how to be apostles of Christ, citizens of heaven. We pray for those living out their Christian calling in the political arena, for those involved in local government, for those involved in national government, for Christian leaders and politicians in countries overseas. We pray for those living out their Christian calling in the service of those in need, for aid workers helping victims of famine or warfare, for medical staff seeking to heal and to alleviate pain, those still working so hard to control the effects of COVID-19. And we pray for ourselves as we seek to comfort and encourage the sorrowful, the anxious, and the lonely. Loving God, teach us how to be apostles of Christ, citizens of heaven. We pray for those living out their Christian calling by sharing the good news of Jesus. For evangelists, preachers, and teachers, for broadcasters, musicians and writers, and for ourselves, that by our words and our deeds, we may invite others to put on the easy yoke of Christ. In the name of him, through whom we have been made a new creation, heavenly citizens, we pray in Jesus' name our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Let's say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And our closing hymn, Where Can We Find You, Lord Jesus, Our Master? you, Lord. 
Jesus, our Master, we want to serve you to answer your call. Where do you need us and ask us to follow? What should we do in our service to Now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.